Hello to all of our listeners, and we bring you greetings from Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church, our Sunday school lesson. And this is lesson seven from our Faith Pathways study manual uh, for the month of July, the 14th, 2019. And this is from our Unit 2 of our study, and it is titled, A Heartfelt Covenant. And we know that when we speak of covenant, we're speaking of an agreement. If we would look at it in our legal terms, it would be a legal document, which uh has wording that has been accepted by two parties or two entities. And this is entitled A Heartfelt Covenant. So our lesson, lesson number seven, is entitled Love from the Heart. And our devotional reading is from the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 2, verses 18 through 24. And then our background scripture is Matthew, the fifth chapter, uh, verses 21 through 32. It is also our printed passage, Matthew 5, verses 21 through 32. And our key verse is Matthew 5, verses 23 through 24, and it reads, and I'm reading the NIV, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or your sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Our lesson's aims are contrast outwardly conformity with moral rules with the inner purity that Jesus commands. Repent of times when you have obeyed God superficially or hypocritically. Respond to Jesus' call to take practical steps to live righteously. So our lesson has uh, two sections to it. Uh, the first one, entitled, You Fool, uh, is from verses 21 through 26 uh, from the fifth chapter of Matthew. And then our next section is a lustful look, and that's verses 27 through 30. And then our last section is adultery, and those would be verses 31 through 32. And I think it is a, a good, uh, uh, I guess, a, a good introduction and a good approach to our lesson. Uh, if we read Genesis, the second chapter, verses 18 through 24. Because here we find the inception of God's intent for mankind. Here is where he recognizes or scripture identifies 
that man is alone and it's not good for man to be alone. And therefore, God puts man to sleep and he takes from man and creates for him a help meet. And it begins to dispel or it begins to reveal God's intent, how God gave mankind the responsibility or the ability to name all of that which God created and how everything was afforded unto them and how mankind was had dominion over all that God had created. And when Adam saw his helpmate, he recognized that it was part of himself. He endeared himself to that which was part of himself, the woman. And when we look at the word uh, help meet, uh, in the Hebrew it is uh, pronounced ezer kenedo. And it simply meant that it was the woman is the opposite of the man. She's not below the man. She's not above the man. She is the opposite of the man. She is the man's reflection. And she also is the reflection of the man. When we look at our mate, we're looking at a reflection of ourselves. And when our mate looks at us as men, they are looking at a reflection of themselves. We both are looking at the part of ourselves that we physically don't see. But when scripture says, and they shall no longer be twain, but one, then we in part are the, as we say, my better half, we in part are the halves of each other's whole, if that, if that is understandable. But it would be good for us to read that devotional reading so that it would set forth for us a mindset of when we look into our text. Now, uh, another issue or another observation uh, that we should uh, give credence to is, is that this comes from one of the greatest teaching moments and uh, one of the greatest uh, moments of just sheer utterance from the Spirit of God in the ministry of Christ. Uh, this Sermon on the Mount was the in, in the beginning, in the beginning of Christ's ministry. Uh, there's uh, things that in time we learn to uh, recognize. And one of those things is, or one of those things are, that when we look at great teachers, we recognize their inception and their departure. And what we have to look at here is, is that this is one of Christ's teaching moments at the beginning of his ministry. And a lot of times, uh, those great uh, men, messengers, women of God, when God infuses someone with God's spirit, then 
God recognizes to whom the Spirit is delivered, and that's us, the people of God. God knows that God needs to make a intentional impression upon us as to how the Spirit begins, what the Spirit is addressing, what the Spirit is acknowledging and commanding us to do. And so at the backdrop, we should look at, okay, so this is the beginnings of Christ's ministry. And how does Christ begin his ministry? What does Christ address? What is of significance, uh, spiritually speaking, when we identify in this teaching moment here what Christ is saying? Um, another good perspective to reflect upon is, is we're starting in verse 21, but remember last lesson ended by informing us that unless our righteousness exceeded the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, that we would by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And this it removes us and also excuses us uh, from uh, the statement that is often made uh, that these leaders, uh, people in position of authority, and the responsibility that is hewed upon them, uh, but when they as leaders, when they fall short of the responsibility of what they are uh, placed as authoritative figures to do. When they fall short, uh, that is not reason for those who are subject to them or followers of them to also participate in the same failure. Uh, and so... Um, the lesson, the previous lesson ended by letting us know that we can't uh, use as an excuse that, well, I was following the pastor and he failed, so that let me know it was okay for me to fall. Uh, I was following the director and the director uh, uh, did something uh, out of place, so that let me know it was okay for me to do something out of place. Uh, we cannot uh, accept or we cannot use uh, the failure of others as reasons for why I chose to fall myself. So now when we begin our lesson at the beginning section titled You Fool, here it begins by saying that uh, thou shalt not kill, and whoever shall kill shall be in the danger of the judgment. And then it goes on to explain to us uh, sometimes how the act of killing takes place. Uh, it begins by uh, a fueling anger that builds within us. And so it says that Whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, which um, is translated a empty person or a empty headed person or a foolish person, that they shall be in danger of the council and that whosoever shall say thy fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Hell fire shall be in danger of the consequences of our actions. So be in danger of the punishment of our actions. And so when we look at the beginning section of our lesson, speaking of that uh, anger and the the uh, lack of control to diffuse the anger and allow it to drive us to kill. 
Uh, here, it also lifts something that is very significant because it talked about judgment. And it said that uh, that person would be in the danger of judgment. Uh, now, in the Old Testament, uh, it didn't speak of judgment, and this was brought out uh, in uh, the book of Numbers, uh, highlighted in our lesson, uh, chapters 35, 3 through 31. Also, this was brought about in the uh, commandments in Exodus 20 and 13. Um, <clears throat> but in the Old Testament, uh, the law actually prescribed death for these unjust acts, murdering killing. But in the New Testament here, the traditions among those in places of authority had so concocted the practice of the law, which is why it was referred to as traditions, is, is that now they would ensue uh, with from the council there would be judgment that was actually exercised upon certain acts and because of this uh, Jewish practice where now men would sit and through council they would exercise their judgment on to, to the uh, judgment of those who were not free from the judgment of inappropriate and unjust actions themselves. So then scripture says that if we allow this anger to push us to the point where now uh, we have committed a certain act against our brother or our sister. This anger, then it may cause uh, our brother or our sister that we have wronged to turn, since we could not resolve the issues ourselves, well then we would be turned over to a system, a judge which even though it is a system that is to exercise righteous judgment, those that are in those positions themselves, not being of a righteous nature, may not always exercise the correct judgment. But the ones who are turned over to be judged would then be handed over to an officer and then imprisoned. And so it would be better, what Christ was trying to get across is, is that why allow the anger to reach such a level that now we would begin to curse one another and the words that we speak would enrage us to such a degree that now we would bring physical and bodily harm to each other because we could not resolve and contain and control that anger. And so as we look today, we are in uh, another period or another era of history where violence is at an all-time high. And apparently, violence was at an all-time high during the beginning ministry of Christ's teaching. And so we have now uh, different uh, agencies who are providing anger management courses, uh, conflict resolution. Uh, we also, on the other side of that, to that detriment, 
we also have a fueling of where people are now causing uh, acts of danger or acts of hostility towards one another without even seeing each other. It's done electronically through words that are shared in text messages and Facebook communication. And so we have this rage that is out of control. And the same things that were said on the Sermon of the Mount by Christ are suitable today. Now, one of the other issues that was prevalent during that time was the issue of lust. So our next section speaks of a lustful look. And it talked about through verses 27 and 30, it talked about the inception of adultery. And uh, it speaks very clearly by saying that in verse uh, 28, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And then it goes on to talk about the eye, uh, the eye that uh, brings that image into our mind. And uh, it speaks about that if the eye is causing us to stumble, then we should gouge it out and throw it away. It goes on to talk about uh, the hand of the member of the body. Uh, if we can't control our hand, in some countries still today, uh, they chop your hand off if you are caught in theft. If you are stealing and caught, then they say, well, you can't control your hand. So since you can't control it and you apparently can't stop the act that you commit with your hand, then if we remove your hand, you can't steal with that hand anymore. And by the loss of that hand, maybe you will develop the ability to control your other hand. Otherwise, you may lose it also. But what Christ was trying to impress upon us here was, is that we have to be careful about what we look and see. And because, uh, The issue of the eye is as though it is a camera. I look into a room and there's something that I'm focused on. So I focus on a particular object because that is the entity, that's the object, that's the thing that I was looking for. But Although I had a center or central focus towards the object I was trying to get, my eye saw everything else in that room. It's like a camera. It took a picture of the entire surrounding. And although I was just going to get a pen to write a note onto a piece of paper, My eye saw everything, and such it is in the world today. Uh, We uh, sometimes, uh, it's been said that uh, we should be like horses with the blinders over our eyes so that we can only see in one direction, straight ahead, because there are so many different things stimulations and so many different means of attractions to things that are ungodly, even immoral. And so when we uh, are seeing these things, um, they are putting pictures in our mind. And even though I may not Uh, reflect upon it, even though I may not uh, focus upon it, the image is there because the eye saw it. And so what Christ is saying is is that uh, we have to be careful 
of what we allow in to our mind, the images. We have to be careful about how much attention we give to those images. Because regardless to whether we think so or not, there are marketing studies that are done which have affected all of us. Marketing studies that are done that say that if we put posters up in a certain neighborhood and if we advertise over the airways and if we uh, put advertisement on commercials, we find that people will buy a Pepsi because the image has already been implanted in their mind. They heard it on the radio. They saw it uh, on the TV commercials. They saw it while they were looking at newspaper articles and magazines. And for some strange reason, although I wasn't really thinking about uh, that's my favorite soda brand. But for some reason, I when I begin to think about beverages and what do I want to buy, you know what? I think I'm going to buy a Pepsi. I don't know why, but I, for some reason, I just thought I would get some Pepsi. So we have to be careful about the effects and how they uh, infuse our mind. Now, our last section, verses 31 and 32, focuses on adultery. And the inception of the adultery uh, came uh, from the previous verses, 27 and 30. But here now, Christ deals with the, uh, the effects of the adultery. And... It is lopsided, it's biased, but it is the practice of mankind. So when we look at what it says here, it identifies how that this system, and speaking of the Pharisees and the scribes, those in places of authority at the time. So it it talks about how uh, commandments through traditional and social practice had been manipulated to the point where now the woman who was made to be the helpmate and to be the reflection and to be the opposite and the companion and the self of the other self, that entity is now being misused and being victimized by the misuse from her mate. So the scripture says, it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you, that anyone who divorces his wife without exceptional, I mean, without the exception of sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So during this time, and it is unfortunate, yet it is still present, women are still viewed as second-class citizens they are still treated through our legal systems as not equal to their mate. So, now this is not God's doing, but this is the tradition of men. This is not a curse or this is not some uh, punishment of God, but this is the works of of social calamity, the downfall of mankind. And so the woman, and I am not saying for all of the sympathizers, I am not saying that all women 
are righteous and virtuous and pure as the driven snow. Uh, No, that's not what I'm saying. And neither are men. What I'm saying is there is a social cultural ill here. And what Christ is trying to say is, is that what the practice was is men would just divorce a woman because they had interest in another woman. So they would find some grounds to divorce their present wife and then move on to their new wife. Uh, Not that they had corrected themselves in any shape, form, or fashion, but just that they had new desires. Well, in doing so, they had rendered the woman a divorcee. And during that time, a woman's wealth was valued or it was established upon her mate, her husband, and the wealth that he had obtained. Well, once he divorces her, he takes his wealth on to his new wife, which renders his previous wife unable to provide and care for herself. And so now she is subjected to the whims of other men. And being subjected to the whims of other men, she is misused. But then she is spoken of as though she is the problem. Why, how dare her uh, subject herself to prostitution and sleeping with strange men? Uh, What is wrong with her character and her virtue? And that was the setting during this day and this time that Christ was addressing. And when we look at this, uh, we can bring it full circle to today and just think of how this fuels and how this gives way to all types of failures and distortion in the social circles. When women are degraded and denigrated to less than what God created them to be, this is a fall and this is a terrible social decay. And this is what women are fighting against today worldwide. And There are men who recognize it and are joining the surge. But I must say this. The women have determined that they are going to be treated as humans and not subjects with or without the assistance of men. And uh, having a wife and a daughter myself, I say more power to the women of God who have finally decided they will not be subjects anymore, nor will they be ill-treated. So I hope that something was said uh, in this lesson. And again, if we would look at it through the perspective lens that this is in the early beginning of Christ's ministry. It gives us some uh, insight into what the social settings and ills of that day were. But Christ did not turn a deaf ear to it, but at his beginning, he addressed them. So God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.